factory Ford, the first producer of a, a, a car in the US. That is Ford. Can you see Henry Ford? Who introduced what they call assembly line, where, uh, where cars are produced? But no person takes ownership of the production of such cars because the car moved from one uh, special, uh, specialization to the other. And this people in this speciality, maybe some will fuse the car door handle, some will fuse the tire, some will fuse the tire rod, some will fuse the engine. So until it gets to the finished product. So nobody can take ownership that this was our project. Can you see? So that was, of course, uh, 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 and it was uh, the idea of Fordism was popularized by Adam Smith, who believed that each worker producing just a minute part of the product and doing exactly what they know what to do with will multiply productivity. Can you see? And of course, profitability. And of course, at a lower wage to the working class. Can you see? And of course, a person like Kamas who is, of course, uh, one of the Aden people promoting the interest of the working class, uh, particularly when he wrote his uh, famous book, The Das Capital. It was actually exposing how the capitalist is exploiting the working class. Okay, you see? And of course, he was able to say that specialization is, of course, labor exploitation. Okay, you see? So, Specialization is still used in, in organizations and in industry today. We still use it even in UJ and of course at NAST, can you see? That is why you have a industrial psychology department. That is why you have marketing department. That is why you have accounting department. That is how you have different departments. We are all working on what we know best. But take for instance, uh, the teachers that are teaching in those days in the primary school. A teacher will teach you, one teacher will teach you mathematics, one teacher will teach you English, one teacher will teach you biology, one teacher will teach you chemistry, one teacher will teach you physics. Can you see? So those teachers are jack of all trades in those olden days. Can you see? The specialization has not made a teacher who taught biology, he doesn't know mathematics. A teacher who taught I remember my dad, who was also a teacher. My dad can teach us all the subjects. Arithmetic, when we were in primary school. Arithmetic, agricultural science, English language, everything. Because that was how they were trained in those days. But as a result of specialization, some teachers cannot even feature in other uh, fields of studies. Can you see? So that is specialization. Everybody now working on what you know how to do best. It is advantageous, but of course it also has its own demerits. That is why also in organization now we have different functions. So the degree to which tax in the organization are subdivided into separate jobs is known as work specialization. And of course, like I told you, which is also stemming from uh, Smithan uh, theory of division of labor. Can you see that it is part of division of labor that everybody should focus on the kind of work they do best. So that is of course division of labor in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in economies or in management, can you see? And of course, apart from that, you can see that even uh, from the animal kingdom, if you know the termites, the termites also do divide labor. Among the termites, there are the soldiers. If you are a very good observer of the termites, for those who work in the farm sometimes. Yeah, we used to go to the farm because my dad was an agriculturist. So we'll see the behavior of termites. Some are soldiers, some bring all the little, little things to build that they are uh, uh, mud. Some bring, uh, you know, different kind of things, you know, the way that, that is division of labor for you. Can you see? So, the vision of labor that is make efficient use of employee skills when labor is divided. The vision of labor increases employee skills through reputation. That is to say, the more you do one particular thing, the more your skills of doing that becomes uh, uh, increases, or you become efficient or proficient in that particular skill. 
less less between job routine uh, okay less between job routine increases productivity that is because you are not focusing on doing that job for a long time it increases productivity because it comes to you you do what you do you pass to the next uh, employee or the next person he does all you do he pass until the finished program so less between job downtime increases uh, productivity between job downtime increases productivity specialized training is more efficient can you see because now people are specialized in what they do then definitely you can choose somebody on that speciality that he or she have chosen can you see allow use of specialized equipment that it also allows the use of uh, specialized uh, equipment all right so these are some of the positive aspects of uh, division of labor all right but however as we continue to work in terms of specialization of course productivity will be increasing the more we, we, we the more we push towards specialization but after a time there is uh, the impact of economy of specialization you can see the rising trend there in terms of of course uh, the curve the upward curve and you see but after certain time of using specialist or specialization you see that the economy of uh, scale or the productivity will begin to decline because specialization is now producing a diminishing effect in the form of monotony, in the form of fatigue, in the form of boredom, and so many other things. Because the more you do one thing, repetitive things, that it becomes simplistic. It's no more challenging. Can you see? You become bored. You become, it, it, the job becomes monotonous. Can you see? Monotony sets in, fatigue sets in. And at that stage, productivity will begin to decline, you see? And that is why we need an industrial psychologist in the workplace, you see? So specialization is good. In the beginning, it will lead to increased productivity. But after a while, a person doing one particular thing all his life will become so fatigued. He will see his job as too monotonous. You see his job as not challenging because there's no skill, uh, there's no skill variety, there's no task identity, like we have mentioned uh, in terms of uh, uh, skill variety on that team. There's no skill variety, there's no task identity, there's no challenging job. The job is not challenging. You are not using your brain. You just, if you are facing a part, you just come to work every time you are putting the same part. The more the car will move, you put the same back. After some years, you become so fatigued because of monotony, can you see? So after some time, specialization can begin to yield what we call diminishing returns and productivity can decline as a result of that, all right? Now we move to the next aspect, which is of course, uh, 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 departmentalization. But before proceeding, like I told you, Kamas was an ardent critic of specialization. And in fact, I will also uh, send you an article on that. I have written an article on that, which was uh, published uh, uh, in the uh, World Journal of Organizational Dynamics. All right. So that is that. Uh, uh, departmentalization, the basis by which jobs are grouped together. Can you see? Related jobs are grouped together under departmentalization. Grouping activities, according, it could, the grouping can be according to function, the function they play, like of course we have in some organization, we have finance function, we have of course human resources function, we have of course re, maybe retail function, we have of course purchase function, you know, according to the different function in the organization. And of course, departmentalization, product can be, uh, of course, department can be grouped according to product that they are producing, either product A, product B, product C, product D. Department can, of course, 
be demarcated according to product. Maybe one of the department is producing a, a cold drink, another department is producing soap or bathing, another department is producing a, 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 a coffee or any other product. They can demarcate it product A, product B. So departmentalization can take place according to product. Of course, departmentalization can also take place according to geography. Can you see? If the organization have branches all over the nation, they can departmentalize according to geography. Maybe one is in Woodhook, another one is in another uh, uh, adjoining city in Namibia, another one is uh, in another environment in Namibia. Like for instance, in terms of South Africa, maybe one branch uh, is in Johannesburg, another branch is in Cape Town, another branch is in Durban, another branch is in uh, uh, Polikwane, another branch is in Eastern Cape, can you see? On the basis of geography, organization can departmentalize uh, uh, their operation, can you see? And of course, departmentalization activities can also be grouped according to process. Can you see? The process with which goods are produced from the introduction of raw materials up to the output, can you see? So, uh, uh, departments that work together uh, in terms of sequential processes can be grouped as a department. You see? That work in related processes to get the finished good can be grouped uh, into a, a single department. And of course, departmentalization can also be done according to customer side. Can you see? Customer side, some could be old customer, some could be young customer, some could be female customer gender. If you go to like uh, Woolworth, you see that Woolworth have branch for women, women product. If you're looking for ladies product, you go to that place. And they have also another branch for men, Woolworth, or uh, most of Mr. Price. They have area for men, area for female, area for children, and area. That is customer side. So departmentalization can also take uh, place in that uh, particular format. All right. Are you guys still with me? Yes, Prof. Great. I hope nobody is sleeping after the lunch. Sophia, no are you, Sophia, are you still with us? Sophia. I think so Sophia is there, Prof. Maybe she's just on mute. Oh, okay. Okay, I just want to make sure she's not sleeping. Then she's dead. <laughs> Lunch was heavy. <laughs> you, know, after, you know, after afternoon lunch, <laughs> I can get some. some uh, bro, this is the most, it's the most challenging time after lunch, yeah. and especially Sunday. Yeah. Okay. Sophia, wake up, wake up, wake up if you're still in the class. <laughs> All right. We we'll progress. So, uh, of course, departmentalization can also uh, be arranged according to customers or be grouped according to customers. Now, we are still talking about organizational structure. Another element in organizational structure, uh, which I have demarcated is, of course, uh, uh, authority. Authority. Authority is the right inherent in a managerial position to give orders and to expect the orders to be carried out or obeyed, you see? And of course, we have another concept among the elements of organization and structure, which is of course chain of command. Chain of command is the unbreaking line of authority that extends from the top of the organization to the lowest echelion and clarify who reports to whom, to the lowest level and clarify who reports to whom, you see. And of course, we have another concept or construct, which is of course, unity of command. Unity of command is a subordinate should have only one superior to whom he or she uh, reports to. And all these things are part of the principles of management, which was initiated 
by Henry Fire. Can you see? Henry Fire is the father of principles of management. Henry Fire is a French uh, 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 philosopher or management guru. He was the first to actually catalog the 14 principles of management. And which are the principles of management? You can say unit authority is there, chain of command is there, unit of command is there, specialization is there, and all that, all that things. Esprit de corps is also there. So unity of command, that is a subordinate should have only one superior to whom he reports to, because if you have more than one sub, uh, superior that you report to, sometimes confusion can set in. But also in current uh, in reality, in current uh, uh, organization, at uh, times uh, employees find themselves reporting to two superiors. But we will address that when we progress with this particular uh, 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 chapter or with this particular slide. All right. We'll progress. We're still talking about organizational structure. Now we are going to address span of control. Span of control is simply the number of subordinates that a manager can efficiently or effectively direct. The number of subordinates that a manager can efficiently and effectively direct. And the concept is that wider span of management increases organizational efficiency. That when the span of management uh, increases, a wider span increases organizational effectively. That is, when we have wider span, the span of control will become more narrower. And as such, there will be lesser hierarchy. Can you see? Because hierarchy is all about bureaucracy. Can you see? And hierarchy, when hierarchy is too steep or too long uh, uh, in a pyramid format, uh, definitely there will be a lot of middle managers who should be costing the organization a lot of money to hire middle managers. And I hear you know, most of these insurance brokers now saying, eliminate the middle man. So organizations now are really working hard to eliminate the middle man. So that is why I said, why does span of management increases organizational efficiency? All right. Now, narrow span drawback. There are reasons why narrow spans are considered to have certain drawbacks as opposed to a wider span. Some of those drawbacks include, include some of those uh, drawbacks include, I'm just coming, all right. Okay, some of those drawbacks for narrow span include expenses of additional layer of management. I told you that, you know, because if you have narrow span, it will be a, a tall pyramid and you have a lot of middle managers, like you see. Then another uh, 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 disadvantage of narrow span is increased complexity of vertical communication it increases complexity because you have to pass through one chain of command to the other one level of management to the other so it increases complexity of vertical communication that is communication from top to bottom and of course from bottom to up another drawback or disadvantage of narrow span is that it en encouragement of overly tight supervision it encourages very tight supervision and discouragement of employee autonomy. When there are so many managers, employee autonomy is denied. You see, because each and every manager want to exert their authorities or exercise their power. All right. Now you can see now the two span, span of control. You can see on the left hand side is span of span of four operatives look at the manage managers level level one to six okay the light has come I think this other laptop can be charging 
And in fact, I can also put uh, the charger of my, uh, the lamp. Let's give it a minute. What do you say? The diagram there. Why well, was a narrow span is not uh, always the best? With a narrow span, a span of four operatives, we have almost six manager, managerial level. One to six, if you count it, one, two, three, four, five, six, managerial level. But of course, when we use a wider span, which is a span of eight, we are having just one to four managerial level. One, two, three, Four. That is one eight sixty four fifty uh, five one two. Can you see? So you can see that we are in terms of managers under uh, under eight span of control. We'll be looking towards about five hundred and eighty five managers from level one to four. But under four span of control, we'll be looking towards one thousand three hundred and sixty five managers which will cost us an enormous amount of money. Can you see? And which is effort, which is inefficiency. Can you see? When we are spending more money for managers, the one we use is a span of control, we'll be hiring just about 585 managers. The one we use narrow span of control, which is a span of four, you can see the pyramid there, which is which will warrant a lot of hierarchies. Uh, 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 and the organization, can you see? So definitely we'll be needing about 1,365 manager with all their bureaucracies. Can you see? Is that clear? Yes, professor. Fantastic, fantastic. That's a good right. diagram, thanks, Prof. Yeah? That's a very good diagram. Great, great. Thank you very much. And uh, I want to hear some other ladies. Let me hear other ladies in the class. Are you, is that clear? I want to hear other ladies' voice. I think I'm hearing only one lady's voice. Is that clear? Other ladies in the class. It's like they have all vanished. Wow. Can somebody answer from the ladies? Guys, are you all still hearing me? Prof, we hear you loud and clear. Okay, why are the ladies quiet? Or oh, they're not I in the class any right longer? Maybe they're, they're still on lunch. lunch. Oh, how many are we now in the class? Can somebody Erta come is here, me? but she says she's on mute. Okay, can she on her, uh, her this thing and uh, let's hear her voice? How many are we in the class now? Please, can somebody confirm? Somebody should confirm for me because uh, my slide is covering now uh, the whole page because I'm using now. Uh, uh, yeah. 13, including yourself. How many? 13. So 12 yeah. students and then you as professor. We are 13 students. 12 students and professor. Four students. 12, 12, 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. Where are the ladies? I want to hear your voice. What a man can do, a woman can do. I need you to contribute. <laughs> I, need you to, I need you to contribute in this class. <laughs> Not just and, the and silence. They want 50 50 <laughs> representation, prof. Yeah? <laughs> they want 50 50 representation. Uh, definitely. <laughs> because I sense I'm hearing only one lady's voice, you know. 
in terms of contribution. I want all of us to contribute. It's our class. Hmm? It's not the professor's class. It's not the lady contributing class, uh, the other lady that is contributing, or it's not the male uh, colleague's class. It's our class. Please, I need, your, I need to hear your voice more. All right, we we'll progress. Now you can see what we are still talking about organizational uh, structure. What is organizational structure? And you can see now when we talk about centralization and decentralization. When we talk about centralization, that is the degree to which decision making is concentrated at a single point in the organization. Can you see? Uh, when we talk about decentralization, we're talking about the degree to which decision making is spread throughout the organization. That is other functional areas within the organization or units can make a decision, you see, can take a decision. And when we talk about formalization, that is the degree to which job within the organization are standardized. Now, if we want to take a good example of centralization, you can see the man sitting in that table, the top one. That is where decision is ma making is coming from. The single individual and everybody now will have to obey him. Can you see? Now, when we talk about formalization, that is the degree to which job within the organization are standardized. And if you look at that, that the man sitting on that table, you can see that everything look alike. So there is standard practice. Can you see? So the one at the bottom will emulate the middle manager and the middle manager will emulate the CEO or the top manager there, can you see? And everybody's wearing the same uniform or the same uh, clothes, tie, black tie. And I gave you an example of, of course, uh, the banking sector in Nigeria, where all employees are, are expected to be on suit during uh, bank hours, can you see? Unlike South Africa, where people wear casual or a gym, we went to the bank. Let me see. Maybe, maybe, Prof, if I can probably just ask a question before you continue. Yes. Okay. I, I remember you alluded to, I, I've seen in West Africa, hmm. um, all the bankers, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a must for them to always dress in professional attire. Yeah, yeah. Um, is, is, it, is it a cultural thing that side? Is it the respect? Because at the end of the day, a banker is a banker. Mm -hmm. what, 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 what's the difference? Because in South Africa, like you alluded to, South Africa and Namibia included, mm. they are actually dressed down. But in West yeah. Africa, they're always dressed up. Yeah. No, I think uh, that is just a culture. So that is why I say people have cultural differences. And uh, how they see it, you know. Maybe bankers want to be dressed professionally, and it could be informed uh, by, of course, uh, British. You know, British are very formal, and most of West African countries were colonized by the British. Unlike, of course, uh, the Southern African countries that have a kind of mixed uh, colonization. Like in South Africa, you have the Boers, you have, of course, uh, uh, the Dutch, and all the rest. So you have, of course, Britain also uh, part of it, and all the rest. So. Along the line, in fact, particularly uh, the apartheid regime in South Africa were not strictly Britain, can you see? So maybe uh, it could also be from that historical context. You know, Brit British, British, they are very official and uh, very formal, <laughs> formality in Britain. So maybe that is where the banking sector in Nigeria is drawing their own, uh, because Nigeria was a British colony. Uh, during the colonial days. And of course, most of the West African countries like Ghana was a British colony. And of course, uh, uh, countries like uh, also, uh, uh, what are those countries around there again? Uh, countries like Togo. Togo was a, a French uh, colony. And of course, uh, Ivory Coast also uh, was uh, part of uh, French. Yeah, as a, because of the French colony, Liberia was a mixture of Britain and, of course, America. Also, because Liberia was a free town where all the slaves from Africa were dumped after the end of slave trade. Many of the slaves that wanted to come back to Africa uh, were dumped at uh, uh, Sierra Leone and, of course, uh, Liberia. Sierra Leone, that is why 
the capital of Sierra Leone is called Freetown. Can you see? Uh, it's uh, Freetown for all returnees, slaves that return from America. Uh, that is Sierra Leone, and of course, Liberia. As right, so when you go to Liberia, if you hear a Liberian person speak, their accent is American English. They speak uh, all these black American slangs, you know, in Liberia. Can you see? As I, if you listen to Charles Taylor, uh, the former Liberian rebel leader, who also later was arrested for crime against humanity in The Hague. So if you see him speak, you can notice that uh, he has a, a black American accent, or this uh, American kind of slants. All right. Is that clear? Does that make sense? Yes, Professor. Um, it, could, it could be for historical context, you know, historical context, and uh, uh, people want to be more formal. Whereas uh, in uh, South Africa or SADC region, people want to be more casual. People want to be more uh, 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 flexibility, simple, you know. Uh, but of course, uh, in uh, West Africa, maybe people want to be more official, more formal. Uh, in terms of their dress code, you know. So those are all also part of the culture. And of course, part of formalization that we are discussing, can you see? Formalization. In India, for instance, also, in India, uh, there's not uh, much of that formality among the banking sectors, can you see? Because uh, 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 an Indian man will tell you, you no formality in India, can you see? So on the basis of that, uh, people were uh, what suits them, but of course, the kind of Indian dressing, uh, something like that, all right. We'll progress. Now you can see now that of course, uh, with regards to uh, uh, organizational structure, uh, uh, we are just going to see uh, in terms of structure. No structure is of course uh, permanent. You will appear to be visionary planner if you this appear to be a visionary planner if you decentralize everything everything which is decentralized. Somebody was asking. So uh, 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 the manager said, we have got to decentralize to remove the bottleneck. And you see that organization there is decentralized. You see, everything, the organization is already centralized, uh, the top organization there. You can see everything is connected, but connected to the top person there, you know. Now, he said we have got, because it is centralized, he said we have got to decentralize to remove the bottlenecks. Because after some time, centralization can begin to yield so many bottlenecks. Because decision making is concentrated at a single place. And even somebody may be dying, they are waiting for the main person at the top to, to make decision. So there's no delegation of power, there's no decentralization of power for others to make decision. If the person at the top is not available or if he is busy or if he, if he is sick or absent in the organization. But now one year later, the same manager here is now also instructing people, he said, he said, that because now they have decentralized, you can see now the organizational chart below there, it's not decentralized. There's nothing connecting all of them, uh, all the different functional areas. Now here again, he said, we have got to centralize to be more efficient, okay, you see? So another man who is actually observing his behavior by decentralizing when it was centralized and centralizing when it was decentralized, say, this is a management genius. <laughs> Can you see? So somebody was observing the manager. <laughs> Today he's decentralizing, and tomorrow he's centralizing. So somebody said, this must be a management genius. And definitely also, it also gives us an idea that also uh, managerial practices and approaches are not casted in stone. That there are instances when, of course, decentralization will work best, 
And there are instances where decentralization will work best, can you see? Uh, and of course, we need to look at the merits of both of them and select at least select the merits of centralization and merits of decentralization and use the merits of both of them to achieve synergy or to achieve maximum result. All right, we'll progress. This is just a cartoon, but an illustration of uh, 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 the fact that uh, uh, nothing is casted in stone, nothing is static, all right? We we'll progress. Common organizational design, I see. Part of organizational structure is organizational design, how the organizational structure looks like or how it is shaped. The first one that is the simple structure, or a simple organizational structure. A simple structure is characterized by low degree of de departmentalization, wide span of control, authority centralized in single individual or person, and little formalization. Why are there little formalization? Because most of the simple uh, structures are utilized by new organizations, organization, new ventures that are venturing into the market. So you cannot formalize when there is uh, almost a single proprietorship where the owner is also the manager, can you see? So there's no need of much formality under such kind of organization. But of course, in recent time, even organizations that have hierarchies are willing to talk about need to destroy the middleman, to remove all the middle managers and compress the hierarchies. And in fact, adopt what is known as a flat organization. And if you look at the diagram there, you can see flat organization. For instance, Jack Gold is the owner manager. That is why I told you that it's the flat uh, uh, organization structure is mostly akin to new organization, new ventures. And when organization is at the embryonic stage, definitely the owner is the manager at first and has other people working under him. I don't know, uh, Johnny Moore is a sales person. Edna, Jenna is a sales person. Uh, Bob Monson is a, uh, a sales person. Norma Sema is a sales person. Jerry Plucking is a sales person. And of course, Helen Wright is a cashier. Can you, can you see? He has one kasha, every other person assess people. This is a good example of a new uh, a, 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 an organization in, a, in an infancy stage. Can you see? Infancy stage. And of course, when you look at Greener, uh, Greener's uh, 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 organizational uh, 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 transition, uh, Greener was of the view that organization move from one stage of survival to the other until the final death or decline, can you see? And each of these stage has certain characteristics. At the beginning, it's an organization that is not very formalized, having an owner manager with other subordinates. But as organization move from phase one to phase two, as a result of what we call evolution, definitely, the organization begin to expand, begin to have bigger, uh, more customers. Definitely the organization will need more hands. We employ more employees. As organization begin to employ more employees, the management may start changing. The manager or the owner may not hire professional managers to manage these employees. And of course, as employee begin to expand, ma uh, the manager begin also to think, where can we fit each one of them? Who is a specialist in this? Which is a special as organization move from one stage to the other, the shape and the structure of the organization changes. Can you see? So this is a simple structure, which is mostly akin to, of course, uh, 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 new ventures or new organization. But now, now that other organization cannot adopt single structure, uh, that is why I told you that in within the period of uh, globalization and of course the fourth industrial revolution, more and more organizations are beginning to move back into a single structure organization. 
in order also to become more effi efficient and of course uh, effective. Move to the next one. This is a simple structure. The next one is what is known as bureaucratic structure, bureaucracy. Who is the father of bureaucracy? I just want to hear from you guys. Who is the father of bureaucracy? Who is the father of bureaucracy? Are you guys still there? Yes, we are here. Yeah, who is the father of bureaucracy? We just, we just don't know the answer. You don't know the answer? <laughs> wow. Jefferson. Wow. Who is that? Eric, what did you say? I, I'm venturing a guess. Is it a Jefferson guy from the United States? <laughs> no, that is uh, that is totally wrong. <laughs> yeah, who is the Max, of, who is the Max of, something? Mass Weber. Thank you very much. Mass Weber is the father mm -hmm. of bureaucracy. Can you see? Thank you very much. At least for remem for remem uh, for remembering Mass. Mass Weber is the father of uh, bureaucracy. I hope you did not check your Google. <laughs> Google is your friend. <laughs> I hope you did not Google it. <laughs> no. Okay, I believe you. <laughs> That's why I could only remember Max. Okay, okay. No, I believe you. <laughs> Thanks a lot <laughs> for, for your insight. All right. So, Max Weber is the father of bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is a structure of highly operating routine. Highly operating routine tax achieved through specialization, very formalized rules and regulation, formality, tasks that are grouped into functional department, centralized authority, narrow span of control. I told you, narrow span is part of bureaucracy. And of course, decision making that follow the chain of command. And you see, that is bureaucracy. A bureaucracy organization that is utilizing bureaucracy, the managerial structure is almost like that of the pyramid in Egypt. And you see, where the pyramid moves, and of course, at the peak is small, very tiny. Then with, uh, when it goes down with huge. Uh, uh, individual. And if you look at the diagram there, you see a typical example of bureaucracy. Everybody running to the top. And you see? So that is, and at the top, that is the place of authority, the place where decisions are made. And you see? That is a very good example of bureaucracy. All right. We progress. Now, why? Is bureaucracy still appreciated? I see. The strength of bureaucracy. What are the strength of bureaucracy? Bureaucracy is good because bureaucracy offer economic of scales. I see. Because bureaucracy offer economies of scale. Because when we operate in bureaucracy, of course, if we are of course buying materials, raw materials for the organization. Definitely, it will afford us to buy more things at the same time. You see? So, as such, it offers us economic of scales in terms of how we utilize our resources. And of course, bureaucracy, there is a, one of the strengths again is the minimum duplication of personnel and equipment. Bureaucracy, because there is departmentalization, there is formalization. There's minimum duplication of personnel and equipment because professionals belong to one department. Unique uh, re related profession belong to one department, you see. And of course, another strength of bureaucracy is bureaucracy enhanced communication, you see. Because of course, there's a chain of command. And of course, there's a span of control Definitely before you can, of course, because if communication is uh, uh, a kind of uh, coming only from uh, uh, one particular uh, uh, zone, 
or different, of course, if communication is coming from different places, different people can, of course, uh, get confused. And you see, so it enhances communication, you know, when communication flows from up to bottom uh, to all the other branches, you see, rather than communication or uh, authority to make decision comes from everyone. So bureaucracy enhances uh, communication. And of course, bureaucracy supports centralized decision making. That decision making comes from the central. And of course, nobody can take anyhow decision because decision comes from the top. That is the central, centralized decision making. Those are some of the strengths of democracy. But what are the weaknesses of democracy, uh, of uh, bureaucracy, sorry. What are the weaknesses of bureaucracy? The first one is subunit conflict with organizational goal. There are instances where different functional areas conflict, particularly when the work of one unit depends on the completion of the work in another unit. That can lead to organizational conflict under bureaucracy. Now, also another weakness of bureaucracy is obsess ob obsessive concern for rules and regulation. Can you see? Because of the obsession for rules and regulation, there are certain urgent things that need to be done. Bureaucracy will be waiting to look for rules, to read the policy, to read the rules and regulation before that thing is done. Can you see? So, Definitely, if somebody is dying, bureaucracy or bureaucratic organization will first of all see what is the implication of this person dying before rushing the person to hospital. Just an example, and you see. So, a subsequent concern for rules and regulation can, of course, make certain negative things to occur within the organization. Lack of employees' discretion to deal with problems. Can you see? Uh, bureaucracy does not support employees' discretion or discretion to take decision or to resolve problem. Can you see? Employees must wait for the boss to give them permission or the boss to give to speak for that decision to be done to to be to be resolved. So those are the challenges uh, uh, with regards to bureaucracy. Now the question arises, is bureaucracy still relevant in the 21st century? I just want to hear your, your views. Is bureaucracy still relevant in the 21st century? Colleagues, I want to hear your voice, your voices, if, if possible. Are you still there? Yes, Prof. I, I, I think it's still relevant Why for, the purpose of, yeah. for the purpose of uh, check and balances. Uh, because if uh, decisions are just left randomly at uh, each and every employee, then there will be nobody to check whether it's a good decision or, 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 or not. But I would say that it should just be shortened not to be a very long uh, process of uh, such check and balances. Okay, okay. Okay, no, you having a point. Uh, any other person with a view? Is bureaucracy still relevant today? Is bureaucracy still relevant? With our discussion, is bureaucracy still relevant? I'm not hearing anybody's voice again. Is bureaucracy still relevant, colleagues? It's it's irrelevant, Prof, but it's still it's there. It's irrelevant. Yeah, it, it creates a lot of uh, a, it creates a lot of um, bottlenecks. It is there, but I, I, I really think it's it's overplayed. Okay. Any other person? Any other view? Hmm. 
Any other view? You see, the bottom line of the matter is uh, some people would have loved to say democracy doesn't exist. Now, whether we like it or not, democracy still exists because of big organizations. Big organization cannot use a flat, cannot strictly use flat hierarchical structure, no matter how they try. Universities operate on bureaucracy. Can you see? They have so many departments, so many hierarchical layers, the dean, the HOD, the uh, subject coordinator, up to the vice chancellor. Can you see? That is bureaucracy for you. Because of large organization, bureaucracy still persists. For the sake of standardization of the goods that public sectors deliver to the public, bureaucracy still exists. Can you see? Because the public sector has a role to play in terms of maintaining public goods and of course in terms of service delivery. And for them to deliver standard group, uh, standard uh, goods, democracy uh, still exists. So most bigger organizations are still using a bureaucracy. Sorry, bureaucracy, uh, you know, uh, because uh, bureaucracy sometimes looks like democracy. <laughs> I'm talking about bureaucracy. Bureaucracy still exists, can you see? So uh, uh, bureaucracy is still relevant in the 21st century uh, place of work. All right. Now, of course, we come in case of common organizational design, we have uh, what is called matrix structure. Matrix structure, a structure that creates dual line of authority and combines functional and product departmentalization. And you see, matrix structure is a structure that creates dual line of authority and combines functional and product departmentalization. This is where I told you that, of course, uh, 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 this kind of uh, structure uh, bypass what they call unity of command, you know, because now the employee is answerable to two authorities. Uh, you see, uh, uh, multi structure key element gains the advantage of functional and product departmentalization while avoiding their weaknesses. Facilitate coordination of complex and interdependent activities. Break down unit, unity of command concept. Can you see? It breaks down unity of command concept. Can you see? Unity of command concept. That is a key element of matrix structure. And if you look at matrix structure of a very good university or college of business administration, just like your own college of business or your own school of business, you can see a matrix structure there. Program, program. Uh, programs, undergraduate, master, PhD, research, executive, executive development, community services. And you can see inside those graphs, all those bosses in between are employees. And on the other side, you can see academic department, accounting, administrative studies, this. So employee, for instance, employee who is uh, working under community service will be reporting to director of community service as far as the Dean of Finance on the academic department, can you see? So he is working with two other directors, can you see? And of course, uh, if we are taking somebody who is doing PhD, a uh, person who is doing PhD uh, can of course uh, uh, find himself, uh, uh, that his employee can be in palace uh, in charge of, of course, uh, administrative uh, studies. So definitely he will be reporting uh, uh, to the PhD uh, department, as well as of course, uh, administrative study department, can you see? So that is a kind of uh, multi structure, whereby employee can be reporting to two different uh, 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 specialities or two different boss within an organization, all right? New design option. New design option include team structure. We are talking about team, you know. The use of team as the central device to coordinate work activities. 
characteristics of team function break down departmental barriers. You see, because they are now working in teams and people are taking from different specialities. Decentralized decision making to the team level require employees to be gen generalists as well as specialists. Make a flexible bureaucracy. You see, create us, of course, create a flexible bureaucracy. New design option in terms of organizational structure will have a visual organization. Every a, a visual organization is a small core organization that assesses each non-core business function, such as payroll, IT, manufacturing, etc. Also called the network or modular organization. It is also referred to a network or modular organization. Highly centralized with little or no departmentalization. And you see. So definitely visual cooperation can also uh, be seen as, of course, uh, an electronic uh, uh, cooperation. Small core organization that assess its non core. Business, activity, uh, business function, such as payroll, IT, manufacturing. But of course, it can also be considered as outsourcing. You see, where because outsourcing is, uh, outsourcing organization is an organization that outsource its peripheral activities while retaining his own or while doing his own core activities in an organization. Advantages of uh, modular uh, uh, organization is that modular organization provides maximum flexibility while concentrating on what the organization does best. The disadvantage of modular organization is reduced control over key parts of the business. You see, you may lose control over key parts of the business. All right, a visual organization, uh, for instance, advertising agency, and of course, commission sales representative, factories in South Korea, independent research and development consulting firm, now executive group, can you see? So executive group are just in the middle, but they are outsourcing all these other services to make the organization to function effectively, all right? Now design option, we have of course, uh, new organizational format. For instance, the boundaryless organization, which is an organization that seeks to eliminate the chain of command, have limitless span of control, and replace department with empowered teams. Can you see that is boundaryless organization? Can you see it remove chains of command, have limitless span of control, and replace department and replace department with empowered team. Uh, team form concept, eliminate vertica, which is hierarchical and horizontal department, uh, department internal boundaries, can you see? And of course, break down barriers, break down silos uh, within organization to customers and of course suppliers, all right? And of course, we'll move to the next one, which is of course a mechanistic model mechanistic model of an organization. You can see the other one is, of course, a, a boundaryless organization. Boundaryless organization allow every functional area within the organization to interact, to collaborate. And boundaryless organization also even allow external stakeholders to collaborate, to work uh, with that particular, uh, with different organization within the uh, 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 different uh, units within the organization. Why do structure differ? We are still talking about that. Mechanistic structure. Mechanistic structure is a structure characterized by extensive departmentalization, as you can see in the diagram there. High formalization and a limited information network and centralization. Of course, a mechanistic, a mechanistic structure almost have some of the characteristics of a bureaucratic structure, all right? Now we'll move to the next one, which is of course organic model or organic uh, uh, design structure. 
a structure that is flat, organic is flat. Can you see? It's almost akin to uh, the first structure that was uh, uh, discussed, the flat structure. Can you see? Organic structure is flat. The organic structure uses hierarchical and cross functional teams. Now you see, it borrows now also from uh, 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 definitely borderless uh, organization. Has, and it has no formalization and possess a comprehensive information network and relies on participative decision making. All right, we we'll progress. Now, mechanistic versus informal structure. If you look at mechanistic structure there or mechanistic model, you see that the structure is high specialization, rigid departmentalization, clear chain of command, narrow span of control, centralization and high formalization. And when you look at organic structure, it is cross-functional team, which of course almost is similar to cross-border uh, uh, activities uh, or, or bandless organization, cross hierarchical team, and of course uh, uh, free flow of information, wide span of control, and of course uh, decentralization and low formalization. That has been their motto right from time. All right, with regards to organic uh, model, can you see now that? Organic model want to look more to some aspect of, of course, a borderless organization, wide span of control to some aspect of, of course, a simple structure, decentralization, you can see power is decentralized. That is organic structure. It has certain uh, uh, similarities with certain other uh, 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 structural uh, design of organizations. All right, why do structure differs uh, with regards to strategy? As a result of structure, structure goes hand in hand with strategy. For instance, innovative strategy, a strategy that emphasizes the introduction of major new products and services. That is recognized as innovative strategy. And of course we have cost minimization strategy which is a strategy that emphasizes tight, tight cost control, avoidance of unnecessary innovation or marketing or marketing exp expenses and price cutting. And of course, we have, of course, a, a, a imitation strategy, which is a strategy that seeks to move into new product or new market only after their viability has already been proven. Now, how does strategy and structure go hand in hand? If you as an organization is trying to adopt an innovative strategy, the best structural design for you to adopt should be organic structure, which has a new structure, low specialization, low formalization and decentralization. Because innovative structure needs flexibility. Definitely, you need a new structure instead of a very rigid structure. However, if you are also considering cost minimization strategy, the best structure to use should be mechanistic structure, which has to do with tight control, extensive work specialization, high formalization, and high uh, centralization. Can you see? And if you want to adopt imitation strategy, the structural design should include mechanistic, miss both of them, mechanistic and of course, uh, organic uh, structure. Miss of, miss of loose with tight structure, tight controls, tight control, tight control over current activities, and of course, and loser, lo uh, and loser control for new undertakings, can you see? So that is uh, with regards to imitative strategy. So different strategy uh, can of course uh, work well with uh, different structure or different structure uh, can actually accommodate and support different strategy within organization. That is the relationship between strategy and organization. Why do structure differ with regards to size? 
Size, how the size of an organization affects its structure. As an, organ as an organization grows larger, it becomes more mechanistic. Why? Because there should be more formalization. Characteristics of large organization is that large organizations are more specialized, more specialization, more vert vertical level, which is of course hierarchical structure, and of course more rules and regulations. All right. Now we come to technology. Technology, that is how an organization transfer its input into output. That is, of course, transmuting uh, raw materials into a finished product. So characteristics of routineness or standardized or uh, customized in activity. Routine technology are associated with top departmentalized structure and formalization in organization. Routine technology is associated with centralization. You see. And of course, non-routine technology are associated with delegated decision authority. All right. Now we'll move to why structure differ environment. Environment. Institutions or forces outside the organization that potentially affect the organization performance. Like I mentioned to you yesterday. Environmental factors are those factors that we cannot control. They are outside the organization. The only ones we can control is, of course, the internal analysis, which is our strength and weaknesses. But the external analysis, which is, of course, our threats and opportunities, is something, of course, we cannot control because they are in the external environment. All right. So key dimensions, capacity. The degree to which an environment can support growth is the capacity of uh, that environment. And of course, you have validity. Validity is the degree of instability in the environment. You see? And of course, we have complexity, which is the degree of heterogeneity and concentration among the environmental elements. You can see now, uh, in terms of this uh, diagram, three dimension three-dimensional model for the environment. If you look at that diagram, you can see uh, they have validity, which is of course uh, uh, validity, capa uh, capacity, and complexity. So with regards to uh, capacity, capacity is actually looking at, of course, issues of abundance, and of course, cast uh, uh, resources within uh, uh, the environment. And of course, validity is looking about stability uh, within the environment and of course, uh, uh, the dynamics within the environment. And of course, complexity is of course, uh, uh, either environment is complex uh, in terms of whether it is simple or complex. So manager have to, of course, uh, weigh the balance in terms of uh, 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 developing a, a structure. All right. So the question that I have asked you also earlier on is whether bureaucracy is dead. This is why bureaucracy is not dead. Can I uh, first of all, you have to ask yourself, what are the characteristics of bureaucracy? The characteristics of bureaucracy include specialization, formalization, departmentalization, centralization, narrow span of control, adherence to chain of command. Why is bureaucracy only surviving? And why is it still in, in existence despite all criticism? The, uh, bureaucracy is still in existence because large organizations still prevail. Now you see, environmental turbulence can, call, can be largely managed with a bureaucrat, under a bureaucratic uh, organization or under a, a bureaucracy. Standardization achieved through hiring people who have undergone extensive educational training. And you see, that makes bureaucracy still uh, to, to still be in existence. And of course, technology maintains control. And you see, technology support in maintaining control within an organization. Now, as a result of that, bureaucracy survives and bureaucracy continues to live. Thank you very much, colleagues. So uh, some of the findings, I think uh, we're almost uh, there. Well, yeah, 
sorry, uh, uh, just a look. Organizational design and employee behavior uh, with regards to findings. Work specialization contribute to higher employee productivity. These are just findings supported by uh, some result. Uh, yeah. Work specialization contribute to higher employee productivity, but it reduces job satisfaction. Can you see? And we have I've, I've explained that why it reduces job satisfaction that after some time, monotony and of course boredom and of course fatigue sets in and it leads now to economy of uh, 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 diminishing return, all right? And of course, another research finding is the benefit, the benefit of specialization have decreased rapidly as employees seek more intrinsically rewarding job. Can you see? Because specialization is rewarded according to your performance, rewarded financially. But of course, uh, employees now want more intrinsically, something that comes within them, something that develops them and gives them a sense of fulfillment. Can you see? Rewarding job. And of course, the effect of span of control on employee performance is contingent upon individual differences. Can you see? The influence of span of control on employee, it cannot be the same for all employees. And you see, it's contingent upon individual differences and abilities, task structure, and other organizational factors. Participative decision making in decentralized organization is positively related to job satisfaction. All right. Organizational structure, its determinant and outcome. Can you see? Causes, causes of organizational structure. Some of the reason why we adopt particular structure is either because of strategy, because of size, because of the technology we are using, and as a result of the environment. And of course, all this is determined by structure. All this determines our structural design whether we are adopting a mechanistic or organic structure. And this leads to, uh, or this leads to on the way leading, it is moderated by individual differences and of course, cultural norms. And that will actually inform uh, the outcome in terms of performance and of course, job satisfaction. So implicit model of organization structure. Perception that people hold regarding structural variable is formed by observing things around them in an unscientific fashion. Thank you very much. Any question? Any question, colleagues? Nothing, Prof. Great, 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 great. So we are making progress. Uh, you can take uh, about three minutes, uh, stretch it off your leg. Like. Let's handle the last uh, topic for today and uh, uh, we can go home because I told you that uh, we'll, be, we'll be finishing at least before four or four uh, so that uh, people going to church uh, evening mass can attend the uh, evening mass. All right. Right, so let me let me try my possible best to talk on uh, to talk on the uh, culture, organizational culture. Organizational culture. Okay, just uh, like I said, uh, you guys can take just a, a few minutes, so stretch your leg uh, for 30 minutes. Uh, sorry, for 30 minutes, sorry. Mm. 
How, how many minutes? Three minutes. Three minutes. Three minutes. Thank you, Prof. One, two, three. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, guys, are you all back? Yes, bro. Yes, bro. Okay, good. Yes, bro. Yes, bro. Okay, colleagues, we are going to move to the next topic, which is, of course, uh, organization culture. Organization culture. Institutionalization of the culture, uh, forerunners of culture. When an organization takes on a life of its own, apart from any of its member, apart from any of its member, becomes value for itself and acquire immortality. That is to say that an organization has a perpetual succession. An organization has its own life and can live forever. Can you see? A common perception held by organization members, a common perception held by organization member a system of shared meaning is the culture of an organization. 
organizational culture is a common perception what they believe, what they feel, a common perception held by the organization members, a system of shared meaning, what they share in common as facts or what they share in common as true or what they share in common in terms of their ethos. Can you see? Seven primary characteristics of culture is that one, uh, uh, different seven primary characteristics that you know that you use in assessing the culture of an organization. Number one is innovation and risk taking. There, is, there are some organizations whose culture is based on innovation and they take risk. Can you see? Then you say, ah, these people, uh, they have a culture of risk taking and they have a culture of innovation. Can you see? And of course, uh, another aspect is attention to details. There are organizations that pay attention to details in terms of how they do things, but there are some organizations that are just uh, flexible. Can you see? And of course, outcome orientation. There are organizations whose orientation is outcome, the end, justify the means. Can you see? Outcome orientation. And of course, there are organizations whose culture is people orientation. Can you see? They take people serious. They put consideration. But outcome orientation will be almost similar to, of course, uh, 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 product. Uh, oriented uh, uh, organizations, can you see? They look forward to the outcomes. Why people orientation focus on people, can you see? It could be their culture. There are organizations that are team oriented. I see in terms of how they do things. They do things according to team orientation. But there are organizations where members work in isolation. That is their culture. There are organizations that are very aggressive in their posture, but there are organizations that are very soft, not very aggressive. Aggressiveness could be another way of uh, 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 another characteristics of uh, measuring a, a culture or reflecting the culture of an organization. Stability, can you see? Stability is another aspect, can you see? There are organizations that are very stable, in terms of their culture. But there are organizations that are, of course, uh, 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 very uh, flexible or dynamic in terms of uh, their culture. Right. So culture is a descriptive term. It may be act. It, sorry, culture is a descriptive term. It may act as a substitute for formalization. Can you see? So people say, when we have a particular culture, it may become now something that we have to uphold and a kind of formalization, can you see? Formalize, it become part of our way of life. And because it become part of our way of life, it looks as if it is formalized. Like we were talking about the dress code of bankers in West Africa, and of course, uh, that of South Africa. It seems to us, that of course, the banking dress code in West Africa seems more formal, formalized, can you see? And of course we have a dominant culture. Dominant culture expresses the core value that are shared by majority of the organization members. Can you see? The shared value that are shared by a majority that is referred to as dominant culture. And of course, we have subcultures. Subcultures are mini cultures within an organization, typically defined by department. Different departments have their culture. Can you see? I remember there was a time in our department, we say our culture is simply the best. Can you see? But along the line, also, when we went for one strategic meeting, some people say, no, that's simply the best is too simple, that we should adopt another way and say, be the best. Can you see? So we change our uh, <laughs> kind of culture from simply the best 
to be the best. Can you see? So mini culture, or within organization, other departments have their culture of the way they do things. Typically defined by department designation or geographical se separation. And you see, you can see some organization when you move from uh, uh, Johannesburg to Cape Town, you see that their way of doing things differ, but they are the same organization. And when you complain that, oh, no, this is the way they do it in journeys, but they say, no, we apply different approach in Cape Town. So you come across that. Those are subcultures. Core, core values. Core value is the primary or dominant value that are accepted throughout the organization. Core value. And, you see, and of course, we have strong culture. A culture in which the core value are intensely held and widely shared. That is strong culture, a culture in which the core value are intensely heard, heard intensely and widely shared. What do culture do? What do culture do in that organization? Culture, the function of culture. Culture defines the boundaries between one organization and the other. What one organization do compared to the other? So it defines the boundary between one organization. Number two, culture conveys a sense of identity for members. Can you see? Culture conveys a sense of identity. This is how we are identified as member of this organization. Number three, culture facilitates the generation of commitment to something larger than self-interest. Can you see? If we have a shared interest or a shared culture, can you see? It generates that commitment to something larger than self-interest, can you see? For instance, like uh, in UJ, uh, 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 we may have a shared goal and everybody is working towards that particular goal, can you see? It is our culture that reinforces that, can you see? Facilitate generation of commitment to something larger than self-interest. That is one of the function of culture. Another function of culture is that culture enhances the stability of the system, of the social system. Culture enhances the stability of a social system or the social system. Another function of culture is that culture serves as a sense making and control mechanism for fitting employees in the organization. It serves it, it serve as a sense making and also we serve as a control mechanism for future employees in the organization. All right, we'll progress. Now, culture as a liability. Culture, like I said, can be, of course, uh, 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 can be uh, positive, Culture can also be a liability for an organization. Culture can be a barrier to change, can you see? Of course, when culture's value are not aligned with the values necessary for rapid change, can you see? Because people are, of course, already tied to their culture, or people uphold a given culture, that culture becomes so rigid that even when change comes, it becomes difficult for them to change because of the head culture, can you see? And of course, culture can be a barrier to diversity, can you see? Strong culture put considerable pressure on employees to conform, can you see? To conform to the already existing culture, which may lead to institutionalized bias. Can you see? Institutionalized bias. Another liability of culture is that culture can be a barrier to acquisition or merger, which is also part of reconstruction or also change in organization. Incompatible culture can destroy an otherwise successful merger. If two organizations come together and their culture is not aligned, after some time you will see infighting and that would destroy the measure, you see. 
And we have seen many unsuccessful measures uh, across the globe in recent times. It could be as a result of incompatibility of the, of the different culture, uh, of the different culture of the merging organizations. How culture begin? How does culture begin? How does culture begin? Culture normally stems from the actions of the founders. Every organization have founders. And these founders, when they are starting this organization, there is a kind of set belief. There is something they do. Funders hire and keep only employees who think and feel the same way they do. And you see, most of the funders, they hire employees that will reinforce the way they think and the way they do things. Funders indoctrinate and socialize these employees to their way of thinking and feeling. The funders' own behavior act as a role model that encourages employees to identify with them and thereby internalize their beliefs, values, and of course, assumption. So the culture stems from the actions of the founders. Keeping culture alive. How do you keep culture alive? Keeping culture consistent so that that culture does not change. You keep culture alive through selection. When you are selecting your employee, concern with how we the candidate will fit into Concern, sorry, concern with how well, sorry, the candidate will fit into the organization during selection. Provide information to candidate about the organization. First of all, to know whether they can fit into your culture. And of course, keeping culture alive, top management. Senior executive help establish behavioral norms that are adopted by the organization. Let me see. Of course, keeping culture alive. That can be done through socialization or during the period of induction. That is the process that help new employees adapt to the organization can of course use to keep culture alive, all right. Stages in the socialization process. I spoke about socialization process, which is of course uh, uh, referred to as induction process. Naturally, when an employee is entering into organization, there is some preconception or something he believes about the organization. So that is what they call the pre-arrival stage. The period of learning prior to a new, prior to a new employee joining the organization. So most of the things he has been thinking about the organization, as he enters into the organization, they may be real. But many may be false, or even all may be totally false, the impression he has before he joined the organization. So the stages are pre-arrival. The next one now you enter into the organization, you encounter the organization. When the new employee see what the organization really is really like, and confront the possibility that expectations and reality may, be, may diverge or may be different. And you see. And of course, the third stage is the state of metamorphosis. That is when the new employee changes and adjusts to the work, to the work, work group, and of course, organization. You can see pre arrival encounter metamorphosis. Depending on how employee take these transformations or this metamorphosis, that will inform the outcome in terms of productivity, in terms of commitment of the employee, and of course, in terms of whether the employee will run away because expectation totally differs from, of course, what he is encountering. This also is almost related to psychological contract. When an employee is entered into an organization, there are certain things he is expecting from the organization. Similarly, organization are expecting certain things from the employee. But the situation when an employee enters and he sees something different and his psychological contract is actually not what is uh, 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 beginning to experience, that can lead to a quicker uh, turnover, employee turnover. He will run away, you see. Because what he's experiencing is totally different from what he was expecting when he was joining that particular organization. All right. Socialization program option. Socialization program 
Choose the appropriate alternative to socialize your employee. Of course, we have formal versus informal socialization. Formal can be the formalized socialization approach in organization, whereas informal could be, of course, uh, 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 meeting new friends, or of course, uh, uh, becoming a, a member of an informal group within the organization. And of course, we have individual and collective. You can so socialize somebody into an organization individually. You can also socialize person as a collective, maybe all new employees are socialized together with a collective uh, of uh, uh, already old employee. Okay, so, and of course, socialize, uh, uh, choosing appropriate action. Socialization can of course be fixed or variable. Okay, so, socialization can as well be Syria, uh, Syria, Syria, several of them versus random. Okay, so, maybe once. And of course, investor versus this investor. Can you see? That is uh, 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 choosing the appropriate alternative relating to uh, socialization. Socialization outcome, like we have mentioned, it can lead to high productivity if an employee is properly socialized into the organization. It can of course reinforce the commitment of an employee. It can also lead to lower turnover. If an employee is satisfied with the socialization, he may remain with the organization, which lowers employee turnover. But if an employee is not properly socialized into an organization, it can lead to higher employee turnover, where employee will run away from the organization. All right. So these are all uh, uh, summary. How organization culture form are formed. Organization culture are derived from the founders. They are sustained through managerial action. Uh, the culture is derived from founder, but it is sustained through managerial action. That is why founder at times also recruit managers that will reinforce the culture that they have actually started in an organization. All right. I give example also like Zenit Bank. Uh, of course, the original founder of Zenith Bank was a guy called Jim Movia. And Jim Movia recruited Emefile, who is now, in fact, the governor of the Nigerian Central, Central Bank. Can you see? And over the years, Jim Movia has been able to also uh, uh, nurture uh, Emefile about the banking system, because Jim Movia was also a banker earlier on. And the same thing. MFLA have also developed a lot of managers that also embrace the culture he has also uh, 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 obtained from Jim of Yeah. Can you see? So that culture continues in perpetuity. Can you see? So philosophy of, of organizations founder, the little, uh, uh, you can factor that into selection criteria. And of course, uh, uh, which of course, the top management have to actually use, uh, adopt during selection, and of course, during of course, uh, socialization, which of course, continue to reinforce the organization culture, the culture of an organization. All right. We progress. How employees learn about culture? How do they learn about the culture of an organization? They learn about the culture of organization through stories shared over the years. Stories are reinforced and re echoed over the years. Stories anchor the present into the past and provide explanation and legitimacy for current practices. Can you see? Story anchor the present into the past and provide explanation. So, story stemming from the past are brought into the present and of course provide explanation why things are done the way they are done or things are uh, the way they are. Can you see? So legitimacy for current practices. Those stories become legitimate for current practices. How employees learn about culture. Employees learn about culture through, through rituals, rituals. 
When I mean ritual, I'm not talking about money rituals that you are we are hearing all over Africa nowadays. Ritual simply means repetitive sequence of activities that express and reinforce the key values of an organization. Can you see? The way we do things, certain rituals, certain things we do, how we handle our customers, those rituals become part of our cultures, repetitive sequence of activities, can you see? Repetitive sequence of activities that express and reinforces the key values of the organization. And of course, another way employee learn about culture is material symbol, symbol of the organization. Acceptable attire. So we were talking about uh, the dress code of Nigeria bankers. And of course, South African banker, acceptable attire, what you wear. The office sizes in the organization, that also reinforces uh, how employees learn about their culture. You can enter some organization, their offices are small, small units. You can enter some organization, their offices are open plain. Everybody functioning on his own uh, uh, table. Can you see? Their offices, symbol, is a symbol. Opulence of the office. Can you see? Opulence of the office. How rich the office looks, how decorated, how it is furnished. Executive perks that convey to employees who is important in the organization. These are the ways employees learn about the culture of the organization. Languages used in the organization, such as jargons, special ways of expressing oneself to indicate membership in the organization. There are some organizations that people have been nurtured to be polite, gentle, present yourself in a gentle manner to the customer or to the client. Can you see? That is the culture. I remember once upon a time, uh, 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 one of my friends was visiting uh, South Africa. And I think we went to one uh, cosmetic shop uh, to check for some of the materials he wanted to buy uh, uh, for, for his family. And I think the, the lady there who was attending to all was very polite, smiling and joking with us. And I think when the lady went to the room, the guy said, I think this lady likes me. I said, no, she doesn't like you. That is the culture of this environment. <laughs> that is the culture of this organization. So she wants she wants you to buy your their product, not not in terms of likeness, but in terms of hosting you. Maybe that is how they have been nurtured. So forget about likeness when you are dealing uh, with somebody professionally. Can you see? So the politeness, the language used, the jargon, the special ways of of expressing oneself to indicate membership of an organization. So some organizations nurture their member in those ways of expression, can you see? So that they know how they talk to somebody who is not part of that organization. And the person will definitely value them. And of course, uh, respect the organization. And of course, uh, revisit the organization for patronage, all right? We'll progress. Creating an ethical organizational culture. How do we create? An ethical organizational culture. Characteristics of organization that develop high ethical standard. The characteristics include high tolerance for risk, low to moderate in aggressiveness, and of course, focus on means as well as outcome. Can you see? Focus on how we arrive there and as far as where we are. Can you see? So managerial practices promoting an ethical culture. Some of the man managerial practices to promote ethical culture include being a visible role model. The leader or the manager must be a visible role model. Can you see? And of course, uh, another managerial practices to promote ethical culture is communicate ethical expectation to your followers or to your subordinates. Another aspect for managers to promote, uh, managerial practices to promote ethical culture is provide ethical training to members of your organization. Another way 
uh, in terms of managerial practices to promote ethical culture is rewarding ethical acts. Acts that reflect ethics should be rewarded positively. And of course, acts that reflect unethical behavior should be punished, can you see? That is rewarding ethical act and punishing unethical ones. Then provide protective mechanisms, can you see? Provide protective mechanism for those who will report unethical conduct, such as whistleblower. Provide protective mechanism. That is to say, create a kind of mechanism where people can report to without being victimized or without even anybody knowing who reported the unethical standard or the unethical practices in that particular environment, can you see? For instance, issues of sexual harassment, if your line manager is the person perpetrating sexual harassment, definitely you should have another mechanism to report him. Because you cannot report to your line manager if he, if he is the perpetrator of sexual harassment, which is unethical. All right, we'll progress. Then creating a positive organizational culture. How do we create a positive organizational approach? A culture that built on employee strength. Positive organizational structure built on employee strength. Focus is on discovery, sharing, and building on the strength of individual employees. Now you see, creating a positive organizational culture, uh, 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 one way of doing that is reward more than punish. Reward people more than punish them, can you see? Articulating praise and catchy, catching employees doing something right. Can you see, reward, always look for opportunity to reward and only becoming a, a blood hound. can you see? I remember when I did auditing, they say an auditor is a watchdog, but not a blood hound. can you see? So definitely as a manager, you should look for areas where opportunity to praise your subordinate instead of catching them all the time doing wrong. But when you continue to praise them, when you continue to identify where they are doing right, they will continue to do more right than wrong. So emphasize individual vitality and growth. Individual vitality and grow. Let that be your emphasis. Help employees to learn. Help employees learn and grow in their job and career. Let me see. Limits. What are the limits to positive culture? May not work for all organizations. There are limitations to positive culture. It, positive culture may not work for all organizations or everyone within organizations. All right. We progress. Now, this particular topic uh, is, of course, related to organizational culture, but uh, it has to do with spirituality and organizational culture. And uh, of course, it's not really part of your uh, work uh, for the semester, but let's touch, about, let's touch on it a little bit. Workplace spirituality. Workplace spirituality, the recognition that people have an inner life that nourishes and it's nourished by meaningful work. That is meaningful work, work that makes meaning to them. That takes place in the context of community. Can you see? Not about organized religious practices. Spirit, workplace spiritual, spirituality is not about organized religious practices. All right, we'll keep that in mind. So people seek to find meaning in their work. People seek to find meaning and purpose in their work. Why spirituality now? As a counterbalance to the pressure and stress of a turbulent pace of life and the lack of, com and the lack of community, many people feed their, their increased need. There is increased need to invo for involvement and connection. Formalized religion, hasn't worked for many people. Job demand have made the workplace dominant in many people's life, yet they continue to question the meaning of work. You see, job demand have made the workplace dominant 
in many people's lives. Yeah, they continue to question the meaning of work. The desire to integrate personal life value with one's professional life is also uh, 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 very uh, important or imperative. An increasing number of people are finding that the pursuit of more material acquisition leaves them unfulfilled or unhappy, as the case may be. Can you see? So, uh, 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 characteristics of a spiritual organization. What are the characteristics of an organization that promotes spirituality? Concerned with helping people to develop and reach their full potential. And if you as a manager, if you want to promote spirituality, you should be concerned with helping people to develop themselves and reach their full potential, which is potential of self-actualization. Directly address problems created by work-life conflict. We are spoken about work-life conflict and work-life balance. And in fact, one of my master's, uh, master's uh, former master's student, uh, Kaja Katicha, had written on a work-life uh, uh, conflict. Kaja uh, Katicha. Uh, let me see if I have, uh, I still have her document here with me. Uh, okay, probably it's at home. Uh, Kaja, Kaja Katicha. Yeah, I think her document may be at home. Uh, Marude. Yeah, just a minute, I'll go with you guys. Yeah, Kaja's thesis may be at home, all right. So Kaja wrote about work-life conflict among academics, can you see? work like conflict. And in fact, on the basis of that work, in fact, I have now been requested also to send uh, some paper to some special issues of uh, a journal called Frontiers in Psychology, which is of course one of the top, most psychological and highly uh, cited journal in the world, Frontiers in Psychology, can you see? And in fact, the, the, the guest editor of the journal told me that she has read my paper with Kaja Katicha and she was so fascinated by that paper, can you see? And that is why she is inviting me to be part of her special issue, can you see? So four characteristics of, uh, 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 four characteristics of a spiritual organization. One is a strong sense of purpose, can you see? A spiritual organization must actually have a strong sense of purpose. There must be trust and respect in such organization. And of course, humanistic workplace practice, humanism, industrial humanism. I spoke to you about industrial humanism or human relation approach to management, which was of course enshrined or propounded by Ed Mayer. And of course, number four is tolerance of employees expression. That is of course, four characteristics of a spiritual organization. Criticisms of spirituality. What is the scientific foundation? So you see people say, what is this file? It is still pending, need more research. So you see, they say, it has not been properly explored. It has not been fully explored. There could be certain gaps that need more exploration before we can actually say that uh, uh, the research is complete or it is valid. So it is still pending. It is still a new area of research. Are spiritual organization legitimate? Do they have the right to impose values on employees? That is another criticism or criticism. Spirituality is not about God or any religious values. It is an attempt to help employees find meaning and value in their work. Another criticism is, are spirituality and profit compatible? Initial evidence suggests that they are. Spirituality may result in greater productivity and dramatically lower turnover from, from, from perspective of uh, uh, some of the people that have done research in that area. 
Now, global implication, organization culture, why strong? Can't ignore local culture, can you see? Organization culture, although maybe strong, but cannot ignore local culture. Managers should be more culturally sensitive. Can you see? Culturally sensitive. Speaking slowly and in low tone, listening more, and avoiding discussion of religious and politics. Avoiding discussion of religion and politics. Because religion is one critical thing that have led to so many wars in our world today. Can you see? And politics also is another dangerous aspect. Can you see? So all global firms, not just US firm or uh, uh, corporation, need to be more culturally sensitive. So culture as an intervening variables, employees form an overall subjective perception of the organization based on these objective factors. Objective factors, innovation and risk taking, attention to details, we have listed all this, uh, outcome orientation, people orientation, team orientation, aggressiveness, stability, perceived as, those are perceived as organization culture. And you see, and of course, such culture can be either high, which is uh, restraint, or low. And that will also reflect in terms of uh, performance or satisfaction of employee with an organization. And you see, so the opinion form, uh, the opinion, the opinions formed affect employee performance and satisfaction within an organization or with an organization. So in conclusion, summary and managerial implication, strong culture are difficult for managers to change. In the short run, you see, strong culture are difficult for managers to change. In the short run, strong culture should be considered fixed. You see, strong culture should be considered fixed. Selecting new hires that fit well in the organizational culture is critical for motivation, job satisfaction, commitment, and of course, employee loyalty uh, or in terms of uh, turnover, whether employee is staying or leaving an organization. Socialization into the corporate culture is important. As a manager, your action as a role model helps create the cultural values of employees. Spirituality and a positive culture is very, very important. All right. Thank you very much, colleague. We come to our end uh, with regards to this slide. Are you all still there? Yes, bro. We are here. Yes, bro. Yes, bro. Yes, bro. Fantastic. Yes, bro. Fantastic. Okay, colleagues, uh, we have done our best today. Uh, uh, let me just uh, tell you some of the chapters to do self-reading uh, uh, so that uh, when we come next, we hit straight on us uh, chapters. Uh, these are just uh, chapters that you can just read, which has something to do with uh, individuals and persons with an organization. I would like you to read uh, for your self-reading. Uh, you should read a uh, personality and value, write it down. Personality and value. Personality and value. Uh, and of course, for your personal uh, reflection, I want you to read also the personality and value. Okay. Yeah, do that as your personal reading, personality and value. What we have covered now today, we have been able to cover uh, uh, leadership, the whole of leadership. We have been able to cover foundations of organizational structure. We have been able to cover organizational culture. And of course, the right personality for a global workplace. The right personality for the reaching the high true simplicity, the end of management, uh, and of course, strong versus weak culture. Uh, dismantling bureaucracy, 
I want you to just uh, check your textbook on the organizational culture, uh, the end of management, on the organizational culture or on the organizational structure, as the case may be. On the organizational structure, the end of management. Just uh, uh, see there will be a case study in your recommended textbook. And of course, uh, uh, then uh, on the leadership, I will send you uh, an article of Nelson uh, Mandela, uh, because we have uh, here Mandela 10 leadership lesson, which I have actually uh, explained uh, to you when I started the lecture. Uh, uh, and we, we are done with that. And of course, uh, we have a uh, 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 charismatic leader and transformational leader, trust. Uh, we have covered trust, we have covered leading, uh, leading for the future, we have covered uh, mentoring, uh, which is mentorship. And I also promise to send you, uh, of course, uh, uh, a kind of uh, slide, uh, uh, an article related to mentorship, you know. Uh, then, uh, of course, uh, uh, yeah, with, with regards to leadership. So what you will uh, have to read for your personal uh, reflection, uh, just read the uh, personalities and values as a personal reading. And uh, if possible, also read, uh, uh, you can also read interpersonal, uh, interpersonal communication read interpersonal communication. Interpersonal communication is in page 13 of your handbook. Personality and values and interpersonal communication. Read that aspect, uh, those two, those two uh, topics. Uh, one is, uh, 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 both of them are in uh, uh, page 13 of your handbook. Interpersonal communication and personality and value. So once you have read those two chapters, uh, definitely we have covered uh, so much. So when I will be meeting you again in the next two weeks, then we we'll know that we'll be concentrating on the following remaining topic. Uh, I'm just coming. Uh, attitude and also, uh, uh, okay, we have covered gender. So the three things you read, you can live interpersonal communication. Uh, uh, you can live interpersonal communication. We will do that together. So uh, what you have to read is attitude and job satisfaction. Attitude and job satisfaction. And of course, uh, you can also read the uh, personalities and values. It's a chapter in your book. Then, uh, Yes, you can add uh, interpersonal communication. Read those three chapters before we meet. Uh, I, can, I can still reflect back uh, the interpersonal communication in the class if we have time. So your reading before we meet again next two weeks will be interpersonal communication. And of course, personality and values. And of course, uh, attitude and job satisfaction. Read that, that is 30 chapters before we meet again. So awesome. that when we meet again, our focus in the class will be on perception and decision making, motivation. Motivation chapter have almost two chapters in the old uh, textbook. Uh, probably in the new textbook, they may all be consolidated in one chapter, but it's a long chapter. So we will be dealing with, uh, sorry, uh, I don't know why I'm marking, I'm, I'm marking it because uh, I need to know the areas we have not covered. So let me leave it on that. So when we meet again, the topic we'll be addressing will be perception and decision-making, perception and decision-making, motivation, theories, and application of motivation. Then uh, we'll be addressing uh, 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 we'll be addressing power and politics, and of course, conflict and negotiation. Can you see? 
So when we meet again, we'll be addressing this four critical chapter. And if we have more time, we will use it also to talk into those three chapters I ask you to uh, do a self-reading. Is that clear? Yes, Prof. I just have a yes. question um, okay. on mentorship. Did you say that you were going to send us an article? Yeah, I will send you an article on mentorship. Okay. And then also the article about Mandela. Yeah, I will send you also the article on Mandela. And in fact, I told, I, 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 told, I think we'll discuss about mentorship today. Yes, but very briefly, Prof. Uh, very briefly. Yeah, I will send you an article on mentorship. All right. Thank you. Yeah, because with regards to mentorship, I remember we touched a little bit on uh, mentorship relationship. Just uh, give me one minute. Uh, let me... It was only one slide, if I recall correctly. Oh, one slide. Okay, let me just uh, let me check where where we touch on mentorship. On so I'm very interested in that topic personally. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, let me just uh, see leadership. Uh, uh, okay, I don't, I don't actually know why we jumped it. Uh, I think it was in chapter 13, Prof. Chapter 13. Okay. Mentorship. Okay, uh, just a minute. Let's 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 touch on it a little bit. We still have ten minutes to go. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, just a minute. Uh, let me just uh, let me just touch on that a little bit. Uh, stop sharing. Yeah, are you guys seeing it? Mentorship. Yes, Prof. Okay, great. Uh, that is just a short one, but like I said, I'll be sending you uh, some uh, some materials to assist you in terms of that. Uh, just a minute. Okay, mentorship. Contemporary leadership roles, mentorship. A, a mentorship uh, relationship is uh, a situation where a senior employee uh, who sponsor, a senior employee who sponsors and support a less experienced employee, which is of course referred to as a protege. And of course, uh, they normally say a good teacher present ideas clearly, listens, empathize, you know, so there are two functions of a mentor uh, in terms of career development, coaching, of course, assisting a mentee, and of course, sponsoring a mentee. I remember some years back, I sponsored my mentee to the US uh, to go and present a paper that, uh, that uh, both of us co-authored, can you see? So those are the assistants a mentor gives to a mentee, can you see? And of course, uh, you coach, of course, uh, your mentee in terms of career development, you help them to grow. And of course, a mentor also provides psychosocial, psychosocial support to a mentee in the form of counseling, you counsel him. And when he's passing through challenging time, you give him advice, you counsel him, you help him to overcome uh, his fears and challenges. And you see, those are some of the roles of uh, a mentor. And of course, uh, sharing, you share ideas with him. You share even some of your resources with your mentee. You know, you, you become automatically a role model of a mentee, uh, of your mentee. Uh, of course, mentorship can be both formal or informal. Can you see? Formal mentorship arises when organization at times have what they call uh, 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 like uh, uh, a kind of quick promotion uh, opportunities and certain uh, uh, younger uh, colleagues are assigned to already successful senior colleagues to be mentored. 
by the organization. Those are former mentorship. And of course, in terms of former mentorship, uh, former mentorship, sometimes uh, people find it, people feel that it is not always uh, uh, sometimes successful uh, because people were assigned to people. But we have informal mentorship, which of course also develop for spontaneous, spontaneously when a younger colleague approached, approaches a, a senior colleague who has already succeeded in his career and request him to mentor uh, him or mentor her, can you see? So mentors tend to select, uh, like I mentioned earlier, mentors tend to select protege or uh, mentees who are similar to them in background. Can you see this may restrict minorities and women. For instance, if somebody is a white male, he may, he may want to mentor only white males. Can you see? And of course, some people also avoid also issues of scandal. And you see, if I'm mentoring not a female as a male, some people can think we are befriending ourselves, you know? So some, some men shy from that. Which is why, of course, in order to also improve mentorship among women, there is need for more women to move into the uh, leadership cadre so that they can also take over some women to be mentored. But like I told you also, so women who have arrived at the top tend to also restrict or hinder other women from coming to the top, which is where I spoke about the Queen Bee syndrome. Can you see, with regards to mentorship. So these are uh, uh, some of the dynamics around mentorship, you know. And uh, I think I have also touched on uh, self-leadership. That is a set of process through which individuals control their own behavior, you see. Effective leaders, uh, that is of course super leaders, help followers to lead themselves, you see. So important in self-managed team. That is very much important. Uh, when we are relying on a self-managed team. And of course, to end have, up, yeah, you have a question. I think we have, we have covered this. Uh, we have covered we have this. Covered okay, okay, this. Okay, okay, yes. okay, okay, okay. No, I thought, uh, I thought we jumped that slide. Okay, so if we have covered no, that. No, no, you, you have covered it. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Okay, colleagues, that is what you got for mentorship, but like I promised, I will be sending you a full article published by myself and uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Sylvia uh, Schobert, your human resources manager at NAS, the, uh, on mentorship. Uh, I think it has to do with mentorship at NAST. So at least it can give you additional insight and additional literature uh, on mentorship. All right. Is that clear? That's clear, Prof. Okay. So colleagues, don't worry. I will be sending you a lot of materials, a lot of things to read. And uh, make, sure you, make sure you buy a folder where you'll be keeping all the materials that I sent to you. In fact, that is what most of my MBA students uh, normally do. Both working in government, both, both working in the military, they always have a folder. In fact, I envy them when they show me some of the materials I have given them within a short period. So buy your folder and keep each of the materials and keep them, organize them properly in such a way that materials are, that are related are in the same, maybe in the same column or if you are demarcating the folder. Is that clear? Yes, Prof. Okay, so tomorrow, uh, Cephas will teach me how to uh, uh, upload uh, most of the materials. Uh, then uh, once I upload it, I will call one of you. I know that there's one of your colleagues now that is always uh, in contact with me on WhatsApp. So I will let him know that uh, I have already uh, uploaded all the materials. All right. Yes, that will be Franklin. Okay. Thank you very much, colleagues. And uh, it was wonderful uh, spending this session with every one of you. And uh, I must say that uh, you are a very fantastic class. And I appreciate every one of you. Thank you and have a lovely Sunday. Thank you, Prof, and uh, enjoy your mass. Okay, bye. Thank you, Prof. Bye bye. Okay, bye. Sabrina, Sabrina. Bye, Prof. Bye, Prof. Who's calling? Eric?
Yeah, I just want to know, you refer to chapter 13? Do you have a book there? No, no, on the slides, um, he ref oh. when we, I think when we started with leadership and trust, it was chapter it 13. Was chapter 13. Oh, you yeah. got an excellent memory. <laughs> <laughs> wow. On a Sunday. <laughs> on a Sunday, yeah. All right, colleagues. Yeah, all right, colleagues. Thank you. All right, thank you, all the best.